the same oh that's better this is the best so far i would say so yeah it's like the producer says you should switch something and then you do the leland sklar switch you know that's i don't know what that is sorry i'm missing that reference uh you, you don't know that you, you know leland sklar the bass player yeah i mean i know that i've heard of him so he's done like you know thousands of records for you know all these pop stars yeah he has on his bass like uh you know uh, like a fake switch <laughs> like kind of like to change the sound and then like he, he there was one really cool interview on youtube with him and he's like in the studio and he says like the producer said like yeah leland it was a good take but can you make your sound more i don't know like you know present or something change your way of playing and then he says like the trick is that the producer sees you when you do the do the you know the switch thingy yeah and basically play the same and then after the track uh, you ask the the guy if it was you know better and then the yeah. guy's like yeah yeah that, that's a that better sound that's like, yeah i've totally done that <laughs> yeah <laughs> I've done, definitely done similar things because what can you do you know i love some structure some instructions are just indecipherable <laughs> This is kind of like this now, almost. Yeah. But it's okay, man. I mean, I hear you well. I mean, it's... How about this? I have a gain knob. I've never really used this microphone. I tried to use it once, and it, I just thought it really sucked for, for guitar, so I put it away, but... Is this some? Is this louder? I have the gain all the way up. Same. Kind of the same, yeah. All right, all right. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I quit. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I hear you. I, I hear you well. I mean, it's it's okay. good. So. All right. Well, first of all, thanks for taking the time. I mean, uh, sure. Thanks for inviting me. I've been a uh, how would you call like uh, you know? Uh, oh Jesus! Mo Jesus! Both of them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you poor guy. <laughs> That's keeping me busy for the last the couple of years. So, I've been a true Monder, Monderstunt or a Monderian or whatever you would call that. So. Oh. Uh, so thanks for writing, first of all, this uh, amazing music to keep us all guitarists busy all around the world. <laughs> and slightly frustrated also. <laughs> so. No, there are better things to do, I think, with your time. Yeah, I, I love it. It's such a challenge to, to just sometimes just to pick it up and play like 20 minutes at least to, to get into two bars of it and not go well, anywhere almost, but it's fun. I mean, I can't probably play most of it myself anymore, so if that makes you feel any better. Uh, maybe a little bit, I think. <laughs> no. But I, I wanted to ask you first, you know, I've done a couple of these interviews and I mm -hmm. spoke to uh, Tony Mallaby like two or three months ago, and uh, mm -hmm. I saw then this footage you guys did from Barbes, like it was a live stream. <laughs> oh, God. <Did> yeah. <laughs> Well, I didn't. I don't. Afterwards, or I think I I might have watched like the first ten minutes, but like I my something went wrong with one of my cables or pedals, and and so that was a little bit of a disaster. Yeah, I spent like the first ten minutes just trying to figure out which pedal didn't work, and <laughs> but the so it's amazing, Cutterwise. I couldn't yeah. really watch it. Um, yeah. But, but that, that, is, awesome yeah, that, that is one of my favorite bands to play with. It's always always super fun. But it's completely improvised, this trio? Or? Yes. That's the only concept is no <laughs> no tune. Once I brought in a melody and, you know, that was, I was like, what's the point? You know, he, Tony can come up with something better, but I'll just leave him to his yeah. devices. Yeah, I mean, uh, so yeah, we've been doing it for actually quite a while. Like, I used to play with Tony and his, at first it was a quintet and then it became a quartet. Or, I mean, it, it went through some different incarnations, but 
but the whole time we would do we would occasionally do gigs of just like improvisation with a drummer so i have this distinct memory of there's this place called the internet cafe on east third street yeah you know it you, you've been there i've heard of it yeah i've never been but like all these guys have been you know john hollenbeck and rainy tom rainy told me about it and drew and yeah it was just like a literally an internet cafe there were like computers lining both walls and it was very little it was very awkward like you stood there and sort of faced a wall oh, <laughs> we're on crazy. both sides of you because there wasn't really room and uh but it, it was great because they just hired you could play anything you wanted in there wow. um and so i i remember back in i don't know it must have been like maybe 98 or 99 Back that far, uh, playing there with Billy Mintz and Tony, and we, I don't know if Tony told you this when you talked to him, but they came at the, uh, some city, I don't know what you call them, but somebody came in with a, with a, a decibel monitor, oh, yeah. just as we were reaching like the loudest because we were playing pretty loud anyway and we were reaching like the loudest part of a already really loud gig i love that and they were going around to clubs to make sure you know the volume couldn't be above a certain level or the club would be fine and and we were like way over the limit and i think the club was fined like thousands of dollars because of our oh, dumb shit. gig which probably paid like 60 bucks you know oh my god um but so we, when, when did you we, first time miss Play, Sorry? When did you, the first time you played with Tony, what, do you remember, actually, or? Mm, no, I don't really remember the very first. I remember the first time I met him was at uh, the Knitting Factory. Oh, wow. Um, we were just both, I may have been, I had a regular gig there in the tap bar, which was one of the event, one of the rooms in there. And, and, um, He's probably playing in a different part of the, um, oh, yeah. the, the compound. And uh, yeah, we just, um, I think he introduced himself or something. Yeah. And pretty right. soon after that, we he started a, um, he started a group with, I don't even remember, I think, I think it might have been. It was Jeff Williams and Ben Street and me. I'm pretty sure that really? was the Really? Oh line. wow! That's amazing. But this was now recorded, right? No, this was no. that. Oh wow! Um, yeah, so that was already like 20 years ago. Um, but yeah, we've been doing this. The thing that you saw that that project for quite a while now, and you know. What I love about it is that there's like absolutely no pressure. Yeah. In so many situations where you're reading all this difficult music, or 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 if it's my music, that's even worse, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and there's just like a lot to stress out about, and in this case, there's you know nothing to stress out about, or at least so I tell myself. And uh, so no discussion beforehand. No, just. Um, so yeah, we've done it with Nasheed Waits a number of times, Billy Mintz a number of times, and, and yeah. Tom Rainey. Tom, um, yeah. The last, well, I guess, okay, the last time we played was the, that live stream, but the last time we played for an audience was on March 3rd. Oh, just the, before the lockdown. Just yeah. before, yeah, maybe like a week before everything shut down. I think Tom told me, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, and that was my, uh, so Joe Bransford recorded that with some good, you know, equipment, and it's gonna, you know, we edited, edited it down a little bit, and, and it's gonna come out as a record. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's something good that came out of this. Yeah, but uh, you, you've met also, like, I mean, f first of all, I, I want to ask you in this improvised context, mm -hmm. like, you know, I, I spoke about that with. Tom as well. I mean, I've played with Tom and Tony a lot, and it's, it's you know, these both of these guys are such incredible imp free improvisers, and yeah. 
especially with Tom, for me, it's like, you know, I asked him, you know, how does he envision his impro? Like, because he can start like, you know, a snare drum and play that for one minute and just stick with an idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's one thing I really love about him is he'll really follow through. Like he's got so much patience. Yeah. And see so far ahead and, and just he, he's like a very long form thinker. So so it can be very compositional. Yeah. Um, yeah. So sorry, what were you? Were no, you... I was just thinking like, how, how do you you know, w w with Tom, I'm so sometimes when I, I go into a free impro, I'm afraid like, okay, this is going on something too long, you know, or, you, you know, when your mind sometimes drifts, like, how, how do you jump in the water of free impro without being scared in a way? Or how do you stick to an idea as a guitarist? I mean, without those two guys, let's say. Um, well, I, I think... I think you just need to develop a sense of patience and and the sense that you don't ever really need to do anything and especially if you're being supported because everybody supports everyone else if you're being supported by people as competent as them and with such a, you know fecundity of ideas uh, as them you really have to do very little uh, and I generally find that the less I worry about actually acting, mm -hmm. the more ideas I get. Yeah. You know, it's like the more you take your conscious mind out of it, the more your whatever creativity yeah. can sort of come yeah. out. Um, Makes sense. So yeah, in a way, it's sort of. I mean, it's even a cliche a little bit, but just. To, turning your mind off and letting the sounds dictate where, where the music goes. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. It make, make and sense. if, you know, if, and be okay with just playing like a note for however long you want. Um, and again, if you're like relaxed enough to be okay with just playing one note, a lot of times a lot of other notes will just come up. I'm like, oh yeah, but I could do this too. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the beauty of yeah, for me, I don't know about everyone else, but for me, the key is like, like absolute relaxation. So people say like a little bit of stress is good for them. Any stress is terrible for me. Like I just, I can't function. <laughs> Like if I feel like a little bit of adrenaline running through my arms or whatever, that's uh, I'm impaired. Like there's nothing that comes oh, out wow. of that. Amazing. And uh, you know, and that happens when I'm when I'm actually playing music that like I've, I've written. Uh, that's a I haven't really figured out how to de-stress from that situation. It's I mean, once in a while I'll have a gig where I. I feel like I'm sort of like almost in control of what I'm doing but mostly the, no mostly I'm just a little bit out of control and, and uh, yeah I feel like the performance generally suffers for, for that so that's yeah. another reason I really like this improv thing you know yeah. I never never have that conflict yeah makes sense in a way but, but you meant uh, Drew Grass told me that you and Tom, you and Tom and Drew, that them that they recorded your first demo before you released one of the trio records, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. They we did a couple of demos, actually. One of like a I don't even remember, like in the maybe like 1988 or nine or something. Yeah, let's see. Wow. We went up to this studio and recorded some, I think it was just like five tunes, direct to two track, you know, we did a monk tune and a couple of standards and really, there was a, I believe that there was a blues head that I wrote that I will never <laughs> play again in public, but I did write a blues. Um, wow. <laughs> and that was, that was mainly just to get gigs. I wasn't trying to even 
get a record deal with that, but it was yeah. bad gigs, which, by the way, did not work. <laughs> I don't think I got a single gig from that. Um, and yeah, then a couple of years after that, um, I noticed that some friends of mine were starting to get record deals, and that was like a huge deal for me, or for all of us, you know, because yeah. we're super young and like at, you know, at one point I thought if I actually ever make a record, that would be amazing, you know, like I can't even imagine that that could happen, a record, you know. Yeah. So, um, so I thought, well, you know, let me try my hand. I've been writing some music and. Um, so, so I thought, well, if I finish this, if I finish enough tunes, maybe I'll, you know, just try this myself and see if anybody bites. So, yeah. So, Drew and Tom and me we, we actually went to, um, not not Baltimore, but a place near Baltimore to um, a, a friend of Drew's. He had a studio in his basement. Uh, his okay. name was Richard Roder, and. You know, at that time he was doing a great, just he was getting like great sounding things out of out of that basement. Yeah. So we drove all the way down there. Um, I think spent the night so, and did a couple of days, and again it was it was on like direct to a two inch tape. Um, <laughs> And then I, I did some solo, solo stuff, maybe at a different, on a different session. Edited, edited with a razor blade. Seriously? <laughs> yep. There wasn't a ton of editing, but what there was, it was done with, yeah, Richard did it with a razor blade. Oh, my God. Um, I mean, you could do wonders with a razor blade, you know, some of the best records ever made were done that way, obviously, but um, <laughs> especially if you're maybe 30 inches per second. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is what we did. But you still have those tapes, like for, for, of those sessions, or? Uh, I hope so. That I, I think I still have those. Uh, you know, um, I did all, all my records up through, including Oceana, which was 2005. I did them yeah. all on tape and just because I was, I don't know, a little bit dogmatic about it and wanted that tape sound and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then after that, I was like, this is ridiculous. It's expensive. It's heavy. It's like nobody's going to ever know the difference. Also, so I think, right? Cried. Well, I didn't know it. It wasn't all like edited like that, but but the first stage was to, you know, was to land on tape and then yeah. um, it was edited digitally. But, um, but anyway, my point is like, I, I had this closet full of tapes. It was like hundreds of pounds and, and I finally just got rid of all of them. Just cause I, you know, what am I going to do? Like remix yeah. record from 25 years ago. But, uh, but I think I did keep those sessions. Those, those are, I think, Pretty sure they're still in there. Those original oh. sessions from Richard's basement. Oh, it's, it's, cool. Um, it's be cool to hear them. Uh, no, nah, it wouldn't be that cool. <laughs> Trust me. No, come on. <laughs> um, and so from there, I you know made a sequence and manufactured like two hundred cassettes. Oh yeah. You know, printing and everything, and like my number on it, and <laughs> and then composed this very what I thought was an eloquent cover letter, and sent sent out packages like mailed packages to like probably seventy labels. Wow! And didn't get a single bite. Not a not a sing not a nobody wanted. Really? It. Jesus. Yeah. And this was. I'm not sure if I wanted to, if I, if my thought was to actually press this thing that I made, or if it was just to get another, you know, to get another session happening. But yeah. some people were nice enough to actually write back 
Yeah, that's um, nice to, to get, right? Yeah. yeah, but they were all like rejections, but some of them were pretty nice about it. Some of them were like too much reverb. <laughs> At least one said that. Too much reverb. Somebody said like it, it didn't it didn't move me at all, but try ECM. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's yeah. a funny one. Which, you should write this down. This so that's a good one. Which I I, I did not approach ECM. I approached none such just because I was so young and ignorant. I didn't yeah. know how I, I think um I got the, the guy's number from somebody. Anyways, made yeah. a long story short. Well, it was right, it's already long, but uh, I, I got nothing out of that first demo. But I, you know, yeah, I still have it in my closet, I guess. Yeah, no, f funny. I still no. have. I think I still have one of the maybe like one of the original cassettes. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow, that's a crap. That's quite cool. Come on, that's like you know, that's history. That's thirty years ago. So. Oh God! That, yeah, don't remind me. That's amazing. Like, it, it it's so funny because you you know those records made such a huge impact, like Dust and Flux, at least on me and uh, which you did in the nineties. And that's you know that's like twenty five years ago. And I I spoke with mm. Mark Elias the other day, and we we just thought about like the music that was made in the early 90s right like mm -hmm. for me now it still feels like it's not old because i don't know why but but it's actually like something that if you listen to something in 1985 that means that we we would be talking about music that was made in mid 50s which is like generation of mid 80s would talk about elvis presley so it's kind of like that so it's basically really history you know right? yeah i know i think about that sometimes I think it's sort of you orient around like when you were born, you know, I, I feel like so somehow 30 years or, or like 10 years before I was born just seems like an impossibly long time ago. Yeah. Whereas it like a different 10 year span doesn't, it doesn't feel like anything at all, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's interesting. But, yeah, no, but I know what you mean. There's, I mean, there are a lot of things from the '90s up that don't really sound dated. Definitely not. I mean, those already for me, the flux and dust are like. I still put them all on nowadays, and it's like, damn, you know, it's. Well, it's as fresh as it was back then, I guess, you know. So. Well, it's gratifying to hear, thanks. Yeah, I mean, like, from the, the compositional point of view and, and anything, it's... Uh, that's why you've influenced, I guess, this generation of guitarists, us that came after you so much, because I think every one of us listened to those records so much, and it's like, yeah, th that's why it's so important that... Uh, I don't know, people get to hear about that stuff, like, you know, uh, I think that's really important. So, yeah, anyway, I bravo there. <laughs> but uh, I, I, want, I wanted to ask you, Ben, about one other thing. Like, I noticed with Tony, right? Yeah. You play a lot with distortion. And mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, first of all, it's kind of then you could get this legato sound, which is kind of like a saxophone vibe going on. But of course, you can play all the harmonies as well. But uh, why, especially? Uh, first of all, why did you develop this distortion sound? Where where did this come from through your musical development? How did you get through the to the distorted sound? Well, aside from being a rock player from the start, yeah which probably influenced it a lot or influenced how I hear the role of the guitar a lot. Um, like you mentioned, it, it it is easier to sort of emulate a saxophone-like uh, linear approach yeah. with, with a more like saturated sound like that. Um, 
I mean, I'm still I'm still looking for like a decent distorted sound. I don't feel like I've found it yet, and uh, I'm like too lazy to just try all the pedals and combinations of things that I, you know. I just even know, don't know don't know where to start. But at this point, I'm I'm using like two different distortions. So I have a, a rat, which is modified, and, and then I have a lighter one from a Walrus Audio called a Mayflower. Okay. Those, and sometimes they use them both together, but often they're just either one or the other, and like depends. Yeah. Like how aggressive I want the sound to be. Um, so yeah, a lot of times I'll just use the the Mayflower, and, and it, that ends up being maybe a little more like sax-like. Yeah. Um, When, when I have the responsibility of, of like filling out that much sonic space because there's no bass, um, yeah. sometimes I feel like the, the distortion just helps the, like the breadth of the sound. So even if I'm just like playing chords, you know, yeah. if, I have, if I have the right level and, and you know, in, in combination with the right other effects, um, I guess to the to the sonic space that I want. Yeah, you create like waves with Tony, I hear like with distortion kind of, that's like, I get this idea, you know, like this like with the distortion, I don't know, underneath him playing that that's... Right, it seems to, seems to um, be, a, be a good way of supporting him in particular. Yeah. Yeah. But the, speaking of distortion, like, uh, did you you, you know, I listened to the last Dan Weiss record, which mm -hmm. is incredible, by the way. <laughs> I love that band that he put out, put together. I mean, all, you know, all of you guys, Trevor and Matt and Craig and you, and it's the and Dan playing all this crazy shit on drums, which is like, where's the one? And, but yeah, it, yeah, but that's a super you, fun project. Yeah, like. But this is like kind of complete opposite, like what you mentioned, like, you know, mm -hmm. with Tony and Tom, you play this free improvised stuff. And that sounds with Dan quite complex. And I, I, I don't know, I wanted to ask you, like, I don't know who started describing this as a metal project. I, I actually don't hear it as a metal project. Like, I guess it, it's distorted guitar. OK, it's still but it's still really improvised and jazz. And but uh, I just wanted to ask you about the, these guys. I, I think John Hollenbeck told me that we spoke once on a tour about Meshuga, mm -hmm. and and he told me that you were really into Meshuga. And I wanted to ask you if this is like really true, like or oh yeah, absolutely. Like when Destroyer Race Improved came out, yeah. I was like I couldn't believe that record, like how how great it was. Uh, yeah. and, and still is, you know, like, um, and it really came out of like, there, there was almost no precedent for it. Like even their previous record to that was not a, anywhere near the same level of like interest, complexity, yeah. um, and, and craft. So like I did, I, at that point I didn't know a ton about metal, but, uh, but it seemed like it was really just coming. It was like coming out of nowhere, and uh, it was super interesting. But did I've you always, ever like you know? I've always been stuff? like a no, or like you know, like those that's, riffs like Soulburn and Future Sorry. Breed Machine, like you know those songs like I think Soulburn and Future Breed Machine, and like the rhythms are so heavy, like to do. Did you ever try to, or did you just sonically listen? To it to get the general idea, or yeah, I just enjoyed it. I, yeah, yeah, okay. I'd probably, um, if I had transcribed it, I'd probably be a better musician, but oh, come on, <laughs> I, no, seriously, but yeah, I, I, I didn't, um, it's quite heavy stuff rhythmically, yeah, so. So that was, did that come out in like 94 or something? Not, not 95, I think, yeah. It was 95, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. 
So, I mean, ever so ever since then, I've been kind of like hooked on that that sound. And, uh, but did that influence your choice of distortion as well? Like you? Oh think... no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. No, no. right? Yeah. <clears throat> I just sometimes get like the you know like the compositions on I don't know o Oceana or like which is for me the the the, the Bible of uh, modern jazz guitar or uh, you know sometimes all these tunes that you kind of remind me of this technical death metal stuff. In I'm a way. sure that yeah I'm sure there's influence there. You know? I love that you know. So yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking of okay. So there's one there's one tune on that record that is a little. Uh, I guess a little more metal influenced, and um, but the the rhythmic structure of that is is it's an idea that I actually got from Guillermo Klein. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, you played with him a lot, yeah. Right. Uh, so he has a series of pieces where. In two bars of six, he'll uh, he'll divide it up into seven, 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 and three. Okay. Right. Um, and and he, he really got a lot of mileage out of that clave. Um, so wait, so I, that's... Just, so, so I just stole that idea, and yeah. thought, well, what if? Instead of seven, 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 three, I put the three in different places in relation to the sevens in subsequent bars. And so, like the metal tune on that record is that's where that comes from. Oh. Ah. So it's it's more like a Guillermo Klein tune than a Meshuggah tune. That, that's a good one. So Guillermo was influenced by. No, he's, he's such a great composer. I love his stuff, yeah. He's, yeah, yeah, but he really this, is. this is not double sun, right? I mean, I wanted to ask you about oh, double sun. So, um, what is it called? Rooms of light. Is the, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. But double sun has this other, this other part, which, which, I wanted to ask you. How, first of all, I wanted to ask you how you write music. But since I'm on this record, like, how did you get that idea? There are like four, four bars on that tune, one structure. Where, where I mean, guitar. It's like you subdivided your right hand, if you remember, like as a piano in a way, because you play the bass notes, I think, like in five. It's kind of like five over three idea, and it's, I think it's five against three. It's five against three, yeah. At, at least it starts out that way. And so yeah. the, the top strings are, are in a pattern of, I mean, the thing is, they're both patterns of four. Yeah. But the top is. The, the bottom is three and the top is five. Yeah. It's... So, and then they're in different keys. Yeah. So I think it's A, A, it starts out in like A major over C major. Or not C major, but it's just like fifths, you know, C, G, and D. But rhythmically, like how, how did you, how did you come up with that? And how long did it, did it take you or does it, did it take you to, to get it like is really natural as a player to play that like really, um, probably pretty long. I don't know. Everything yeah. takes a really long time. Um, don't remember specifically working on on that, but I'm sure it probably took me forever. Uh, where did I? I don't know where I got the idea for that. I think, you know, it always explored to some, you know, sort of superficial degree, the idea of, of polyrhythms and how they can be exploited on the, on the instrument. Yeah. And that was just like the next step and, you know, what can you do? Just like, sometimes, you know, when you, you're thinking of what to write, you just try, just use your imagination and just say like, what? What could I possibly try to tackle, or what problem could I try to solve, or you know? And then it's, you know, it starts out as a theoretical yeah. challenge, and, and then you figure out how to actually materialize it. Yeah. Um, right. 
do remember working a lot on that as as I did on a lot of things, just like on tour buses and airport gates, and, you know. Well, yeah. Like a lot, of, a lot of a lot of work on those tunes are just like wherever you, where, wherever you can grab like a half an hour or, or twenty minutes or. You know. Yeah. But how do how do you, how do you start writing? I wanted to ask you that. I mean, I was always curious to get into your brain a little. Like, <laughs> how do you start writing a composition? Like, you know, because your 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 compositions are like stories and. I think it's always like a long story. That's how I see it, you know. And do, do you write it down first? Like, I don't know how many parts you want to have, or how do you how do you how do you do your tune? Let's say I don't know Oceana or. Um, yeah, generally, I'll, if it's going to be a long form tune, which I, I almost never start out thinking this is going to be a long song, you know. Wow. <laughs> but it, often it ends up that way. Because the you know the idea is like how how much do you want to do with this particular musical idea, um, and how much is too much? And, yeah. And it's kind of like what does it tell you it wants to do, and like how many like where does it want to develop, and the permutations yeah. you want to arrive at, and. So, after playing around with whatever initial idea I have, um, I'll, you know, I'll have a bunch of material, and then some vague form will start to take shape, and then I'll just, and then, like you said, I'll map it out. Okay. You know, A, B, C, D, whatever. Different. Do you write by hand or in computer? By hand. Oh wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, everything is. I had some. Okay, here's. Yeah, please, please. I, I really want to see. Like an example of just something I'm writing now. Wow, that's amazing. I, I I tried Sibelius a few years ago, and it was just like, just felt unrewarding. I mean, yeah. I, I actually, you know, I like it when people give me. <laughs> charts like that because I can actually read them but um, but just for me I just there's something about putting a pencil to paper and erasing it and re re I don't know it, it, it's there's something satisfying about that it's more but, personal yeah. right in a way or I don't know it just feels like I have a more, like a more direct relationship to what yeah. I'm doing no I, I, I don't know what you mean um, Uh, I'm sure there's something like if I had known it a little more about the program, I could have overridden it. But but every time I when I was using Sibelius on something, every time I would write something below an E for the electric bass, oh yeah, it would show up in red, and that yeah. was so annoying. <laughs> that was so that was, I remember that was the last straw. I'm like, fuck this, I'm just <laughs> using pencil and paper. And one thing about Sibelius is like, at least I don't know how you know. I I, I learned how to use it because I, I write write wrote by hand. But people, I, I, my handwriting is so bad. And I, I remember like playing with uh, with Elias, my first recording in New York, and I gave him like you know the sheet, and he was like, "What the fuck? This is like an F sharp or a G sharp? What is this?" <laughs> like, sorry, man. Like, it took us like like for an easy song like to decipher, you know, like half an hour. Or so. That's why I started to use it Sibelius, but yeah, I don't know. It's like I lost. I prefer by hand. Also, like writing things like you, you do like you know five over three and four. It's the beat. You cannot. I don't know how to do that in those programs. I, I guess you can. Well, somebody figured it out because they they put it in that book. But I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It can be done. Yeah, definitely. But. Uh, I mean, it would be good if I knew how to do that. Because if I ever wanted to do another book, which I probably won't, but <laughs> but if I if I did, I, I would like control over like inputting the music into into a notation program. Because uh, let's just say like I I met with some frustration 
with the, in the engraving process, like sending all my handwritten charts out to wherever they were doing it, and then like just having to like proofread like multiple times. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, was, it was a little tedious. Yeah, I can imagine. But I wanted to ask you about your records. Actually, like the later ones, not not the first to three ones, like like Hydra and Oceana. Do you see them like as as a whole? I mean, I, I see your records always like as a whole novel in a way, composed of different chapters. And each of them is really strong, you know, the tunes are strong by themselves, but I always when you put on your record, you can just, I, I kind of get the idea to listen to it um, as a whole. Do you also see it like that, or? Well, yeah, I mean, see, like, sequencing a record is really, is a really important element of production, I think. Yeah. And so, the idea is, you know, just like your favorite records when you, when you were a kid, like, it's, you listen to it as a record. And there's a narrative, and there's a kind of, yeah. you know, there's an arc, and there's hills and valleys, and you know, um, <clears throat> I mean, I I don't necessarily write a batch of music with that like goal in, in mind. Yeah. Uh, okay. But but when I do have enough for for a record. I'm definitely very aware of, of having it uh, you know, having it be some kind of a trip for yeah. 50 or 60 or 70 minutes. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of about programming. A bit. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, you mentioned I mean, like that's it's you know very like God bless you, but like very few people I think listen to whole records these days. It seems yeah, to be the exception. It's a lot lost art, right? I mean, like especially you know, my, my, the students of mine. You, you're, I, I remember. I, I think I, I ordered actually this record directly through you. I ordered like uh, excavation, and t you 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 told me like actually that uh, it was gone, so you burned me a CD, and I, I still oh, have. Really? Yeah, I, I still have the you know the the cover and everything, but the CDs were gone, the audio. So, oh, do you want to? I have. Um, <laughs> it's okay. That was before it was re-released. Oh, it's okay. I I still love it. Because I know I, I mean I need to get rid of them now. I have like a hundred of, of of just like cutouts, so they're useless. <laughs> they're completely worthless. I just need to you know to go. Drop them no. from a helicopter in Central Park or something, but <laughs> just take right. space. W wouldn't mind to have the original, but now the, the idea is just like for me, like you know, it's like I remember getting these records. Like it's it's a it's a whole procedure and experience, you know, taking out the, mm. the thing and you know putting on a CD and even like LPs was. Uh, a better experience, but now right, right. Better. I was gonna say like that's even compromised from from the LP experience. Yeah, it's even more uh, like you're even more of an active participant because yeah. you have to walk over to the turn yeah, you have like, to turn it over. If the record like actually opens up, that's even better. And then yeah, the pictures. Of... But do you remember like your first? I mean, since we're we're talking about LPs, like. Like those first jazz records that you heard, the like LPs that you put on, and you remember the experience. Which albums were that? Like that kind of like say, what the fuck is this? Or like I don't know. You mean as far as just like my first experience listening to jazz? I mean, yeah. I, there were there were only LPs when I was a kid. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, these like, <laughs> didn't exist until I was like well into my twenties. So. Yeah, that's what I mean. What, what was the experience for uh, which, which were the records that really blew your? I, I remember my, my, my first was like the Road to You by Pat Metheny Group. I, I I think I was 13, and my guitar teacher, you know, I was getting bored with classical music, and he gave me a CD of this, and I was like, yeah, I'll listen to it. I went to play basketball, and I I, I didn't listen to it. Then I came home and I pressed, you know, play, and I was just like. Oh. It's changed, you know, my whole perception. I started digging into everything mm -hmm. what's 
happening. And what were those for you? Like, if, if um, well, pretty sure my first jazz record was uh, the Joe Pass Virtuoso. Oh, wow. one. Yeah. Which, you know, that, that pretty much blew my mind. I can't even say that I enjoyed it because it was so far over my head at the time. Yeah. You know, I think I was maybe 15 or 14 or 15. And I started actually taking lessons with John Stoll, who you, you oh, may know. Oh, well, yeah. And he was well. like the local, just was like, a, you know, I'd been playing rock and learning tunes off the radio. And then I thought, you know, maybe I'll actually start taking lessons with a teacher. So I went to the conservatory um, nearby and there was John, you know, and he was the guitar teacher. So well, I didn't, I don't think I realized like he was a jazz guitarist. He was just a guitar teacher, but then he started teaching me jazz and I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll learn this. This is, this is interesting. Yeah. So just to get familiar with the language, I, I bought a few jazz guitar records. Cause, um, I could relate to it because it was my instrument. And yeah. So, yeah. The Joe, so the Joe Pass record, pretty sure it was the first. Oh. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And so like, I recognized like, pretty sure you get all the things you are. I recognized the head. Then there was just like a bunch of incomprehensible notes for a few minutes, and then the head again. <laughs> yeah. That was kind of. The way I process that. <clears throat> There's also a Barney Castle record that I was super into called Soaring. I don't know that one. I'll, I'll check it out. Um, has a picture of like a hand glider on the cover, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, not that one. Blue and yeah, that was that was a great one. Um, Pat Martino Consciousness. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> which um and um. A Wes Montgomery record. Um, it was like a re-release of a couple of older records. So I don't even remember what it was called. It was like a double record with a lot of stuff on it. And that, you know, so those those are kind of like the, my first um, my first Bibles and transcribed a couple of things off the Wes record and um, transcribed. The impression solo from Pat Martino. So those yeah, are cool. the first yeah, thing I did a, as a kid. Yeah. Um, and then once I became more familiar with the language, I, I decided that it might actually be interesting to listen to other instruments and play this yeah. music. Um, did you listen to a lot of piano players, by the way? Or um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yes, a lot of Elevens and, and uh, also, you know, there were like some Oscar Peterson records that I really. Oh wow. Um, I think because of oh man, what is the? I'm spacing on the name of the label that all those records are on, like Joe Pass and Oscar Peterson and. and uh, it's not Riverside, right? No. No, no, no. Um, gosh, my brain is fried. I'm fried. I told you I didn't get much sleep. <laughs> but um, one sort of milestone was like I'm still in high school, and I'm uh, and I'm at a friend's house for I don't know what reason, and his brother was a few years older than us, and uh, and he's a jazz drummer. And he's listening to a Love Supreme in his bedroom, uh -huh. and I'm like hearing the sounds come out, and I'm like, I got to know what that is. I've you know never no exposure to anything even remotely like that before, uh -huh. and that was a, that was a really like a turning point in my life, kind of a bridge from the more mainstream jazz guitar records I was listening to yeah. to like something else. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I got super into with that, like the period of John Coltrane from like 62 to, you know, and, and onwards. Yeah. Mainly like 62 to 65, I was just obsessed with the sound of that quartet. The quartet is amazing, yeah. And 
and mostly what I listened to were uh, like the, the there were the, all these bootlegs from that time. Now they're all I would say they're all out on CD as, or of some sort or another. But but back then it was all just like cassette tapes that you'd get from friends who got it from friends who got it from somebody in you know in Boston. Yeah, like the Berlin stuff, probably, and all that. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So so I had that to creation on you know which just nothing less than a religious experience. You know, listening yeah. to that. Yeah, um, and just on this like noisy cassette, it's just it tells you just how powerful that music is. Like, like the sound quality is so crappy, and yeah. it, like just feel goosebumps just thinking about that. Uh, so I, yeah, I like just stacks of cassettes of train bootlegs. Uh, mm. I'm sorry, I just spend a whole week just listening to those so over and over again, and to definitely. You know, did a fair share of transcribing those. Oh yeah, you did did stuff that. Oh wow, yeah, cool. I mean, as much as I could. Hear, yeah, recognize and hear what he's playing. Those fast lines. It's sometimes like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and sometimes not even really possible. But yeah, yeah. With the overtones and everything, but. Um, but that's kind of where we got, I guess, the legato sound, right? Going on like the, the long li lines that sometimes you make, like on distorted sounds, especially what which you do. From, you know, it had to have been an influence. Yeah, yeah. I love that with you because you, you know, I sometimes hear hear a phrase. It's like, and it ends like a saxophone player would breathe in. So, so you, you make it sound better than it actually is the way you describe it. <laughs> Yeah, but, but that's how how, you, how I hear it, you know, as a listener when when I hear your your lines sometimes, and uh, it's it's so cool. So, well, it's a work in progress. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, for all of us. Or at this point, it's like the opposite of progress, whatever that is. Well, but it, you know, it's it's good times to use it at least that we can practice and write some music or something. So it's yeah. Every bad thing has a good thing as well. But yeah, I have. I have been definitely keeping myself busy. Yeah, R writing some new m music, by the way, or yeah, yeah, that's mainly what I've been doing. Um, I mean, it might be a giant pile of horseshit for all I know, but that's <laughs> that's how I've been spending my days for the most part, and. Um, Probably going to start recording. Awesome. Planning to start recording maybe even like next month. Like a trio stuff or? No, it's mostly solo since I've Oh, really? Oh, wow. By myself. Wow, beautiful. <laughs> there's some, there's some, I mean, my conception is, well, first of all, I have like way too much for a record. So it might be either like double or maybe just two separate discs. Um, oh, beautiful. You know, it's probably like, 75% solo and 25 other things, duos and trios. A couple of things are just drums and guitar. Oh, wow. Well. Who are you going to record it with? The drummer? Ted Poor or some? Hopefully. I haven't even asked him yet, but yeah. That's, that, that's like the unofficial invitation. <laughs> to Ted. Yeah. If Ted, if you're watching this, could you play on my record, please? <laughs> Uh, ben, for your solo stuff, I wanted to ask you, like, uh, that's why I ask you for piano players. Did, uh, obviously, uh, you know, for all the voicings that, and that you get, that I, I get, I, I, you know, that you listen to piano players, but who were the, the guitar players that you listened to as solo guitar playing is concerned? I guess Ralph Towner is probably... Yeah, definitely Ralph Towner, Towner right? Egberto Gismonti. Egberto, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. I, I want to say Ted Green, but you know most of most of what I've heard of him as an improviser has been from like YouTube clips. Yeah. Like I had I had a solo record way back when I was like a teenager, and that blew my mind. You know. Yeah. But uh, but it's even more impressive when, you know when when you see him like improvise and just go effortlessly. Between keys and, and I, I mean, it's just yeah, 
he's just on another level that has never been approached, I think. Such, such um, an underrated player also, I mean, annoying. I think he's about as highly rated as you can be with like, no, like basically zero performing career. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. So considering that, um, he's not going to be like internationally recognized by, I mean, by guitarists, he is. A, yeah, yeah, definitely. Or by the greater public, like, you know, just barely ever played out and, and he died way too young, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and he only really essentially made the, the one record. Um, there's a trio record uh, that he also made officially, but um, anyway. Um, but did you like check, check out like Towner stuff, like like but Batik or like solo concert? Yeah, I love Batik, sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, like, all water, of that. Water wheel. I love that song. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's one of my favorite records of his. 11, 8, I think, or 13, like. Yes. That's so cool, that fell. Um, yeah, just the, like the sound of like Jack DeJanet and acoustic guitar. So somehow it's just like so perfect. Yeah, it is. Like you, I, I guess it's the trick is to, you know, balance it. Like you don't, you don't think of drums and steel string guitar. I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. But no, but it's like I think it's his symbols. You know, yes. you know yeah. Especially on that record, Tim and Towner are like. It's just kind of it, it's like Jon Christensen. You know, like those records, uh, the early yeah, '80s yeah, stuff. Yeah, Solstice records. Yeah, Solstice with uh, yeah. Eberhard and. Yeah, so th those were also very influential. Ah, but, yeah, um, I love that stuff. And also, I was a you know big fan of Oregon. Yeah. Um, yeah me too. So. Yeah, I, I, there was a big like a, a Ralph Towner like tribute concert. I don't maybe trip maybe that's the wrong phrase because usually you do a tribute if someone's dead but yeah <laughs> but it was like Joel Harrison organized this old guitar summit thing which does every year um so we we all played like two or three Ralph Towner tunes at this club that there were like I don't know like 10 or so different guitarists and, and we each had a group and we each like prepared a couple of tunes and he was there so that was a little nerve-wracking did you talk so, to him or yeah yeah I met him a couple of times um, ah. and then in in the the intermission consisted of joel interviewing ralph which was really oh, fascinating um but yeah that was a little bit that was, that was a little stressful. <laughs> what did you play? Which songs did you choose, if you remember? Um, Anthem and... Yep. Um, yeah, I love that one. Simone. Simone? Oh shit, which one is that? That's also from the... Uh, Anna. No, that's not from Anna record. No. Um, I think they're both on the same record. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's Anna. It's like the 90s record or 2000 yeah. something. Yeah, I, I know, I know Anthem, so it must be on the same record then, yeah. 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 Um, I played those with a, a drummer. Beautiful stuff, yeah. Yeah. Ben, um, one question, can, can I ask you just something? I, I really wanted to ask you this, like, how did you, like, when you came in the 80s, in New York, right? Well, I, I'm from New York, so I never really... Like, ah, I didn't know that. I thought, you were, I thought you were like from outer New York. I didn't know you are from originally. Well, I mean, suburbs, but... Um, yeah. Oh, okay. But, I but like, I mean, especially in the scene-wise, like when you were pushing it, like, <laughs> in this... Uh, so, yeah, how was, like, how was that? Like, I felt like, okay, here I am. I need to, like, enter the scene, like, because I'm just sort of like a passive type of person anyway, I never really made much of a, an effort. Um, but I, I'm sorry, was, like, what was your question like? Yeah, no, I wanted to ask you, like, you, you know, like, I, I think with all, all these guys that 
you surrounded yourself with or become involved, especially like David Binney and Donnie McCaslin and all these guys, you kind of have formed like a huge, an amazing, like, I don't know, like uh, Bill McHenry also and mm. all these Theo Blackman, like, when did all this kind of a molding ha started to happen? Like late eighties or like early nineties or? Oh, low, late, definitely later than the eighties. Um, so I, I guess I like officially moved to the city, you know, to the five boroughs when I was twenty-one, maybe, and and I started going to Queens College, so I lived in. Flushing, Queens. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to school, and, and like it didn't take long for me to drop out. So, uh, so I never finished. But, but at that point, I was pretty much all of my professional work was with a like a kind of a funk band. Oh wow! Band. Oh cool. And they they worked a lot, so you know like every weekend and, and a lot of weekdays uh, I was gigging just like driving to, to a lot of gigs were in the Bronx and there were gigs in like Connecticut and like uh, kind of just all over the place but yeah and I was you know working really hard on jazz like privately but I, I wasn't really um, I definitely wasn't doing any gigs like that and, and I barely even knew anybody there was a there was a bass player that lived like near near where I lived and I would get together with him sometimes and play standards and um and like anytime I would go to a gig uh I would like go up to the bass player and like I guess that's the kind of thing you do when you're like super young and you're not that self-conscious yet is like I just like introduce myself and like ask if he wants to play sometime. <laughs> so, and so you know, most of them were actually super nice, and I, I met some you know, really great bass players and just played duo with them. Um, but for the most part, it took quite a while to like get into the improvs, the, the improvisers scene. Yeah. Um, I think a big step was when I was maybe like 25, I started playing, uh, I met this uh, Swiss Austrian drummer named Joris Dudley. And he, okay. he had a, he had a, Seriously? Yeah. Yeah, I know him, yeah. <laughs> you played with Joris Dudley? I didn't know that. Yeah, oh yeah, oh, yeah. And, and he had a, he got a gig twice a week at, uh, at Boggy's, which, is what smoke is now, but um, oh, okay. but for a long time it was Augie's, and I remember we played like every Thursday and Saturday for quite a long time, and you know, so we would just do these trio gigs. Yeah, and, and that was the you know, I think the first time in my life that I was playing jazz like on a regular basis. I felt like that was really important. Um, yeah. Um, remember Essie and Essie used to play with us a lot and. I recall him oh. and played with us a lot. Uh, first time I met Scott Colley was on that gig. Really? Wow. Yeah. He was super young and like big head of blonde hair. <laughs> um, Opposite to now, right? <laughs> okay, and Andy McLeod played a couple of times. I, I don't, yeah. Anyways, that, that was doing that for like a couple of years gave me a lot more confidence to, to you know, as like a jazz player. Yeah. 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 Um, And you know, I, I guess you just meet people just by being there, doing sessions in people's houses. And, you know, I still wasn't doing like a ton of gigs at clubs at that age, but um, mostly doing like, you know, after the R&B band disbanded, I, I was mostly doing weddings, like weekends. Yeah, sure. Um, 
and then I, it probably wasn't until my like early 30s that I started doing uh, you know, more creative and like almost exclusively more creative music for Stuff. a living. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you one thing? Like just like like we, I listened to the, the other day to the quartet with Bill McHenry and Paul Motion, mm -hmm. and I think from that record I transcribed like almost your, all of your solos years ago, I, like by hand, like social unconsciousness. That solo, I, I think I I played it all the time. Oh and, no! Oh no! <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> I have like well, it's like that. I don't remember. I don't remember. But like, I don't remember that being the best, my best effort. But okay. I love. I love those those <clears throat> those records, and I was just like, you know, I, I, when I, I trans, I did like when I was obsessed with a player. I then just that was my kind of meditation. I just transcribed mm -hmm. stuff and put it there. I had like, you know, the first six albums of Chris Potter, all his soul was like, <laughs> and your stuff as a sideman a lot. And But I wanted to ask you, like, how did you, uh, just your story with Paul Motion, wh when did that happen? And how, how did you meet Paul? And because you, you seem to have su such a nice musical relationship going on for a long time, so. Oh, cool. Glad to hear you say that. Uh, well, actually, the first time I met Paul was, um, I mean, first of all, I was obsessed with his groups, you know, before I ever met him, I, I would follow his, especially the trio with yeah. Joe Levine and Bill Frizzell. That's, yeah. I, I, you know, would follow them around like a little puppy dog, you know. Like, really? Oh, cool. <laughs> just go see them everywhere. Um, the first time I actually ever saw him play was at the 55 bar. Um, this trio? Wasn't that trio, but it was Bill and Paul. And I believe Lenny Stern was playing. Uh, wow. And I think, I think they were both. Amazing. I think they were both. Anyways, uh, but their first trio record, like kind of, with, I spent a lot of time on the road with Jack McDuff, the organist, and yeah. had my, you know, they were like long, long, long truck rides across the country and I would kind of keep myself sane by listening to records on my Walkman on you know yeah. sets with little headphones and that was that was a big one you know um just so I really wore that record out um and and, and also is the quintet records Every, anyway like all, all this yeah. stuff I just just was such a, he was such a good composer bigger. Great composer and just yeah, like one of my favorite composers. musical visionary, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like every band he had just sounded like somehow it sounded like Paul Motion music. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, right? Yeah. Um, so in I think nineteen ninety two the electric bebop band had you know, had been going on for not that long, but a little but a, a little while with, with Brad Shepping and Kurt Rosenwinkel and yeah. still moved to Keishi. And he had a gig at the the knitting factory when, when it was on Houston Street and he just called me on the phone. That's when, you know, that was when you called people on the phone because that was the only way, you know, to get in touch with them. <laughs> and how was that like for you? Like, did you believe it actually? It's like, hey, no, I thought it was, I thought it was somebody pulling a prank on me, yeah. to be honest. Um, but he invited me to join them. So it was three guitars yeah. uh, playing mostly bebop tunes. You know, we didn't have a rehearsal or anything. We just showed up and played uh, the Calf Nelson and stuff like that. Um, and the only other thing I remember about that night was there was, everyone thought there was going to be the New York version of the LA riots. So nobody, so everybody was afraid to go out. The, you know, it didn't end up happening, but there was almost like nobody in the audience. Oh. <laughs> uh, so that was my first encounter. Um, and then nothing for like many years. Oh, shit. And then, uh, and then I think, I think Steve Cardenas recommended me yeah, I think um, Steve told me that, yeah, that... Yeah, um, 
I guess around like 2000 or so. Um, because you're in Europe, on the Europe record, which is like 2001, yeah. I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that before Holiday for Strings? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Holiday for Strings. Both of those were done, two, two. Both yeah. of those were done like during tours. Oh, really? Um, oh. Pretty sure, yeah. Um, but yeah, it didn't, you know, nothing but good memories from, from those from those days. Yeah, so he's a great guy, great band leader, obviously, like brilliant musician. Um, but m musically, did he ever like say anything like about the music, what, how to play or not to play or no, right? Not really. Oh, you know, I'm forgetting something. We did. We actually tried a record somewhere somewhere in this timeline, like before before I started playing with with the expanded group with yeah. Steve, but after the Knitting Factory gig, we went into the studio f and and recorded a record for JMT, which is Stefan Winter's label, um, with Brad and Mark Elias. Really? Yeah, so Brad Shepard and me and Mark Elias and Paul, we recorded a Paul Winter record. Oh. Oh. Paul. I don't even know what I, the siren. Winter, winter, yeah. Not much. But, um, but that was never released, right? Or was no, it? No, no, no. Yeah. Paul decided that he hated it. Ah. So it never came out. But, um, but you asked about, like, does he ever tell you what to play? And yeah, yeah. I think yeah. we're maybe like having, I don't remember the experience like that well, but I remember that Stefan was there and, and, when Paul was kind of getting frustrated that things weren't really like going yeah. great or like the music didn't seem like it was maybe as interesting as he wanted. So, yeah. So he was, he started yelling at us, like, just like take more chances, like get your fingers caught in the strings or something on this tape. <laughs> Remember the instruction of get, make, let your, <laughs> get your fingers stuck in the strings. <laughs> That's a good one, actually. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear that, or not, I don't know. But, yeah, uh, I think it would. I mean, if the tapes are still somewhere. Buried. I mean, it's possible it's Stefan has a, has a tape of it somewhere. Yeah, that would be so cool. Amazing. Um, yeah, that's a, that's so yeah, I mean, I think my favorite, you know, my favorite experiences playing with Paul are, are uh, or some of them are, are, are with Bill McHenry's quartet, with so yeah. Bill Reed and yeah, and I love that band. Pretty much, we just we would do a week at the Vanguard every every year for a while. Oh really? Um, yeah, this is super fun because like his his group, you know, was great, but there wasn't a lot of freedom, you know, and he structured it that way. It's like you yeah. take a course you take half a course because there's so many instruments you know and it was like this concise concept which you know worked great but um but to, but to be able to play more over more of like freer forms and yeah a smaller group it was that was really rewarding yeah those re re i mean i love even the not with paul those records rest up and the graphic that you did that the quartet that's so beautiful i mean what, what you play there it's so, so cool i mean well you know, it sounds like a group, really. You know, it's like a mm. the interplay. Yeah, so. I think we, you know, Bill, Bill and I have been doing quite a quite a few gigs back in yeah. those days. Yeah, I, a, I thought we had a good rapport. Yeah. Uh, ben, just just one last thing, so that I don't trouble you too much with a lack of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which is like, you know, I've been I've been a huge fan of Theo Blackman as well. And yeah, same here. Yeah, it's and I, I wanted to ask you. Like, I watched this from Progressive Chamber Music Festival, mm -hmm. one uh, on YouTube the other day. One, it's, the, it's like twenty minutes on YouTube that you guys did, and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, you have to check it out. It's so beautiful. It's twenty twenty five minutes. It's it's from two thousand and seventeen, I think. So, was that at um, Greenwich House? 
Uh, it might be, yeah. But it's, okay. it's, check it out. It's like it's it's not it's twenty five minutes long, and it's uh -huh. you you do some crazy impro stuff in there. Right? And, and I wanted to ask you, like, how, how did you hook up with Theo? I mean, I, I spoke with John Hollenbeck a little because he also collaborates so much with Theo, and kind of a, you guys. I think I think you did Lucy together, right? No, no, no. I, no I you were not schoolies. But how did you guys, how did you connect with Theo? I mean, like, or when, when did you meet him or start playing? Theo, I met Theo the at, at this time. pub called Visiones, which was like a, you know, a New York. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, the landmark. Visiones, yeah. Um, Maria Schneider had a regular Monday night for a number of years, and Theo just came down one night and just introduced himself, and I think, I think at that point just said, I have a, I have like a month of weekly gigs at Cornelia Street, the Cornelia Street Cafe, do you want to do yeah. it with me? So that was, you know, kind of simple as that, that's how that started. But you started like impro or like standards or? No, almost no, it, yeah, it was very little imp improv, like it, 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 it evolved into something else, but um, at first it was just tunes that we would bring in, you know, a couple of my easier tunes. And um, his tunes, with friends of his tunes, plus standards. Yeah. And then, and then maybe like we would each do one solo thing, and that was kind of like the set, or, or that was that was the gig. And then, then I, I felt like like he sounded so good playing like singing my melodies. That's yeah. when I, I thought to add him to my trio that I already had just to like reinforce some of the melodies um, and that's how um, he became part of part of that yeah but, um, it started out as just the, the duo and uh, you know as we both got like more effects and he got his like echo plex and, and yeah. mem memory uh, I don't know he's got some like looping things um, we just started lots of stuff there, yeah. With, with textures and uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Sonic areas. Um, so sometimes just you know just to like relax, I'll put the organize a gig, and I'll just say we're just improvising. Like, don't worry about getting anything right. Like this is, and sometimes we'll add a Question is yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, I might be wrong, but I think John met Theo when John and I were roommates uh, back in like mid 90s. Yeah, I, th I think John told me a lot, yeah, about this roommate thing. Yeah, that's how, yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense then that this line kind of connected there. Yeah. Mm. He told he told me like that, that also him and Theo sometimes they also do improvised gigs, and then they recorded it, mm -hmm. and then I don't know driving three hours back, then they listened the entire way in the car and like yeah, I love what you did there, and then you know, Theo Theo said like yeah I just stepped on the wrong button or something and like <laughs> looped it in a eleven eight or something, and then you know <laughs> so I love it. So quite cool. Yeah, it's funny how accidents sometimes provide the, the best, the best stuff. And yeah. Like sometimes um, you, you can't underestimate that that element. Like sometimes I'll be writing something and I'll be stuck, and then my hand will just like, I'll just because a lot of guitars just aim. Like if you aim for the right fret and you miss, then your aim is off. But so, so sometimes I'll just like my finger will just go to the wrong place and it'll be better. Yeah. So I'll just keep that, you know. That's a good one. <laughs> so a lot of fun. Yeah. To be open to the accidents, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Great. And thanks so much for sharing oh, all yeah, this. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, really. Keep in touch. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs>
Hawker Jazz.